This video is sponsored by Incogni. This absolutely stunning German city was almost completely destroyed by a gruesome firebombing in World War II. But the nearly impossible happened and it went from this to this. And even more beautiful buildings might arise from the ashes. After the war, the city was almost turned into yet another soulless, concrete wasteland like some other German cities. But instead, thanks to some fierce local citizens and developers, they were able to rebuild the heart of this city and restore it to its former glory. This is the story of the rebirth of Dresden. Although they have come a long way, they are not done yet. There is still opposition against the reconstruction of some of its lost buildings. So the beauty and attractiveness of Dresden is at stake. I travelled all the way to Eastern Germany to capture the beauty of the city and got help of my friend Bart to interview some of the key people who helped the city go from this to this. But why Dresden, you may ask? What made Dresden so special? Well, Dresden is not just a random city. It was called the Jewel Box and even Florence at the Elbe because of its stunning Baroque architecture, its rich collection of art and its history. The spires and domes of this capital city of Saxony reflected in the River Elbe. The city was housed to the Saxon electors and kings, Saxony being one of the many states of the Holy Roman Empire. And during the rule of Augustus the Strong and Augustus III of Poland, the Baroque beauty of the city was built. Beauty is Dresden's speciality it seems, there's just so much of it. The Zwinger Royal Palace, the Japanese Palace, the Taschenberg Palais, the city castle, the Hofkirche and of course the Frauenkirche. The kings also collected a wealth of art for all the palaces and for the museums. In the 19th century, the city became the center of German Romanticism, with a number of famous names from that movement working and living here. In that time, the Semper Opera was constructed as well, where Richard Wagner and Richard Strauss premiered their work. But the time of splendor would soon come to an end. It's 1945 and Nazi Germany has overwhelmed Europe with death and destruction. But Hitler was losing the war. With the war, Hitler and his National Socialists had also brought destruction to German cities. Between the 13th and 15th of February of 1945, squadrons of English Lancaster heavy bombers and American B-17s appeared on the horizon. They were there for one purpose only, to drop more than 3,900 tons of bombs on the city. There was little resistance. Most of the anti-air defense had been moved to other parts of the Reich. Wave after wave of bombs hit the city, right in the center. The resulting firestorm consumed everything. The fires were so hot, they pulled all the oxygen out of the air. Those who didn't burn up, suffocated. Winds blew the fire over the city, consuming everything in its path. Thousands of people were killed, while almost 80,000 dwellings had been destroyed. To this day, the attack on Dresden is controversial, as the war was almost won, and the strategic importance of hitting the historical city center, instead of only the factories and the rail yards, wasn't as clear. In any case, the once beautiful city was now in ruins. But before I tell all about how the city moved on to rebuild itself, first a short message from our sponsor. <sighs> Robocalls. How irritating. How many of you have been annoyed by a robocall during your everyday life? These calls happen too often. They make me wonder where they get my data from. And if they can call me, does that mean that they have other sensitive data as well? Today's sponsor, Incogni, is there to counter these worries. Dwight from the office reminds us, identity theft is no joke, and the amount of data breaches is rising steadily. Your name, address, login credentials, and even social security number could be out on the street and sold by so-called data brokers to all kinds of parties, from slightly annoying telemarketeers to truly dangerous criminals. These can do some bad stuff like taking out loans or even use AI generated voices to trick you into sending money to them. Incogni is a company that actively contacts data brokers for you and asks them for removal of your data to make sure that you don't get these problems. And not only that, they will keep hunting them to make sure your data is always being removed. So make an account and let Incogni do the work for you and keep you safe. The first 100 people to use code aesthetic at the link below will get 6 60% off of Incogni. Find the link in the description or in the pinned comment. The city center, once bustling and full of baroque buildings, was now in ruins. The population was set to work to remove all the rubble, and soon it became an empty place where sheep were grazing. Many children born in Dresden after the war were puzzled by the emptiness and the rubble. What had happened? The details of the firebombing were too gruesome to share with these children. So what happened in Dresden became, for many who were born after the war, a bit of a mystery. 
Like for Torsten Kulke, the current chair of the organization that would lead a lot of the rebuilding efforts, the Gesellschaft Historische Neumarkt Dresden, or GHND. Mich hat das fasziniert als Kind, ich sag mal, diese Ruinen, die da standen. Im ersten Moment gar keine Sehnsüchte, sondern einfach Fragen. Na, Fragen, ich sag mal, was da passiert ist. At some point, the questions and intrigue turned into a desire to restore what once was there. Some of the reconstruction efforts, especially some of the most famous buildings, had already started right when the war ended. The Zwinger, for example, the Catholic Hofkirche, and later the Semper Opera. Not all the buildings could be funded by the DDR, which was substantially poorer than Western Germany, which in turn helped financing some of the reconstructions. The socialist government had plenty of other worries, like building enough housing for their workers. After the war, big parts of the city were transformed. The inner part of the historical city center was cleared of ruins and kept mostly empty, but further outside, lots of space was needed for housing. Where once was a tight urban fabric consisting of local townhouses, there was space for a new kind of town planning, based on the car. In notorious DDR fashion, mass housing was built for the workers. The typical standardized Plattenbau. In the heart of the city there was still a gaping wound. Some citizens already started planning reconstruction efforts. And some projects were finished, like the Münzgasse. But bigger and higher quality restorations weren't possible yet. Happily enough, a big change would soon stir everything up and bring new opportunities for Dresden. By the way, if you liked this video so far, please help us out by liking and subscribing. Thanks! In 1989, the Iron Curtain finally came down, and a year later, Germany was reunified. The reunification brought a new chapter in the rebuilding of the center of Dresden. More reconstruction projects were started, or resumed with more funds, like the palace. Although some buildings had been rebuilt, the most iconic landmark was still in ruins, the Frauenkirche. The Baroque church had survived a lot over the ages. Its dome had withstood 100 cannonballs fired by the Prussian army during the Seven Years' War. The dome was so strong that the projectiles bounced right off. Unfortunately, the church could not withstand the advanced high explosives from Second World War and the fires. The firestorm caused the interior of the church to burn out, and the church collapsed on February 15, 1945. For decades, the symbol of Dresden was a mere shadow of itself, with the mountain of debris a daily reminder of the war. In 1990, citizens organized the Call of Dresden, or Der Ruf aus Dresden, a call to raise funds and rebuild the Frauenkirche as a symbol for peace and reconciliation. And the call was heard. Just two years after reunification in 1992, the breakthrough decision was made to rebuild the church. This was a big deal, as it kicked off similar reconstruction projects in other cities and countries, like the Berlin Palace. In 1994, the foundation stone was put in place. The crypt followed, and then the rest of the church slowly started rising. People from all over the world donated to make this happen. With the church getting constructed, a question arose. What to do with the empty void around it, the former Neumarkt? Should it just stay empty? Should it be rebuilt in a modernist way, like the architects wanted? Or should it be restored like it was? It was in 1999 that a group of citizens from Dresden decided that they wanted to make the city shine like it once did. They founded the GHND, the Society for the Historical Neumarkt of Dresden. The GHND not only wanted to make the city beautiful again out of nostalgia, Instead, they wanted to strengthen the city by creating more housing, fixing the urban fabric and increasing economic activity. The original urban fabric of the city was damaged and looking at other, less successful modernist rebuilding efforts, they felt the traditional urban fabric would be a better way to get the city feel and function like a proper city again. Also, they knew how much the people from Dresden yearned for having a beautiful place to drink their coffee, to do some shopping and to just stroll around. But although the GHND knew their plans would be popular, they still faced some major hurdles. First, they needed to convince the skeptical city council that they had the required support of the people. A petition was launched. It was a huge effort to collect the required 57,600 signatures. Forms were distributed to over 100,000 letterboxes. And it worked. They collected more signatures than required showing that they had the support of the people. The second hurdle to overcome was a group of architects. These architects wanted to create something truly edgy, contrasting the beauty of the Frauenkirche and turn the inner city into an experimental laboratory for avant-garde architecture. Dorsten Gulke describes the struggle. Well, the architecture wanted something new. 
und ähm, was Zeitgenössisches. Und äh, die hatte schon immer hier dieses Gefühl, irgendwie stecken geblieben zu sein in den 70ern. Und wollte jetzt mal richtig Gas geben und ähm, mal was richtig Kreatives machen. Hm. So, und das äh, stieß natürlich jetzt aufeinander, diese zwei Interessen. Aber wir haben damals gesagt, also das handelt sich hier um ein Prozent, ich sag mal, des Stadtgebietes. Alle anderen 99 Prozent. Da kann sich die Architektenschaft doch austoben. The experimental laboratory never happened. In the end, a compromise was made. Most of the facades would be true to the originals, but some facades would be modernist. The group of architects was satisfied. In order to build, you also need money. And for money, you go to investors. But who would want to invest in something as ambitious as the reconstruction of the Neumarkt? Happily, at the time, there was at least one investor in Dresden who was eager to help, Bernd Dietze. My name is Bernd Dietze, I'm the Geschäftsführer of Bayerbau in Dresden. We have in Dresden very many buildings erstellt, but the interesting buildings were natürlich die, die wir an im Zentrum Dresdens äh, realisiert haben. Und hier am Neumarkt ganz besonders sind wir da tätig gewesen und hat eine große Freude gemacht, die historischen Gebäude wieder zu errichten. Denn hier war, stand überhaupt nichts mehr da. Und die schönste Anerkennung ist, äh, dass Menschen sagen, das haben sie aber schön wieder renoviert. The buildings seem beautiful and thus costly. But in reality, they aren't that much more expensive. Thorsten Kulke explains. Und jetzt muss man wissen, ich sag mal, dass diese Häuser hier am Neumarkt nie so viel mehr Aufwand sind. Also wir haben hier keinen bayerischen Barock oder tolle klassizistische Fassaden, sondern das sind relativ einfache Fassaden. Und da, da reden wir von Mehrkosten für die Aufwendung ich sag mal, der Fassaden. Die liegen zwischen 3 und 5 Prozent. The investors made construction possible and the third hurdle was overcome. Finally, one by one, the voids at the Neumarkt were filled, and the end result is stunning. But is that the end of the story? No, because there is another important place that used to be beautiful, but had been reduced to rubble. For that, we need to cross the River Elbe and look at the other important Baroque square, the Neustädter Markt. The current Neustädter Markt is a very open place. There's a wide traffic artery, and DDR-era Plattenbau surrounds the square. In the middle is the statue of the Golden Rider which is a statue of Frederick August I, Elector of Saxony. This wide modern plaza is quite different from the Baroque square that used to be here before. Baroque housing flanked a much smaller square with narrow streets leading to and from it. The GHD has launched a campaign to turn this quaint place into another bustling city square, restoring some of its stunning architecture. One of the projects is the Narrenhäusel, right on the bridgehead of the August Bridge. Named after the court jester of Frederick August I, who used to live in the building. Frank Wiesner, a developer born and raised in Dresden, is fighting to restore this building in full glory and is even willing to invest a lot of money to make this possible. Ich bin in Dresden geboren und ähm, wenn man hier lebt, bekommt man relativ gut und live ja mit, wie es jetzt aussieht und hat natürlich dann die Bilder von dem Zustand vor 1945, wie die Stadt ausgesehen hat und da spürt man schon einen gewissen Verlust, Schmerz, wenn man sieht, wie es mal war und dann kann man eigentlich, wenn man irgendwie halbwegs das Herz am rechten Fleck hat, ja gar nicht übersehen, dass es natürlich viel, viel schöner war und auch sehr schwer sein wird, das jemals wieder herzubringen. But rebuilding it isn't easy. Frank Wiesner has been fighting for years to start this project, but due to bureaucratic resistance, it still hasn't been built. For the rest of the Neustädter Markt, there's equal resistance. The GHD has made a great effort to organize design competitions, do surveys among the population and collect signatures to show the wide support for reconstruction of the square. But the municipality doesn't seem to be in any hurry to get the plans through. This is, in my opinion, baffling. It is crystal clear that restoration of the Neumarkt has been an overwhelming success and has made the city more attractive, leading to more visitors, business opportunities and a more livable center. Why doesn't the municipality of Dresden support such a popular plan? That is literally handed to them on a silver platter with cream on top. We can only hope that the municipality of Dresden sees the opportunity and acts fast, as it's so clearly in their best interest. Of course, there has been criticism on the Gesellschaft's plans. There are three lines of criticism. One is political and kind of superficial, and the other one is about protecting other types of heritage. The final critique is about whether it's fake or even falsification of history. The first point of critique is one we often hear when there isn't a real argument, that it is somehow far-right or even a Nazi thing to want to restore pre-war buildings. 
or more general to be in favor of traditional architecture. Frank Wiesner shows how ridiculous this is. Also, ich finde auch ein wirklich schwieriges Kriterium, was Leuten vorgeworfen wird, die mit traditionellen Formen bauen, sie seien irgendwie reaktionär oder gar irgendwo rechtsgerichtet. Das ist natürlich vollkommener Irrsinn, weil ja gerade die rechtsgerichteten Nationalsozialisten, die haben ja die Städte letztlich zerstört mit ihrer initialen Krieg. Und das ist einfach eine Sache, wo ich sage, das finde ich auch nie in Ordnung. Und dem muss man entgegentreten. Wenn wir mit ein traditionelles Haus bauen, sind wir normale Leute aus der Mitte der Gesellschaft weder rechts noch links radikal, sondern ganz normale Menschen, die ihr Geld verdienen, die ihre Häuser bauen. Letztlich das Bürgertum, was auch die Stütze der Gesellschaft ist. Wir zahlen Steuern, wir haben Familien, wir haben Kinder und darum geht's. The second argument against rebuilding is that sometimes DDR era buildings will need to be replaced or will be suddenly surrounded by rebuilt baroque buildings. One example are the prefabricated flats at the Neustädter Markt, which are now protected DDR heritage, even though they are in a pretty bad state. Torsten Kulke explains. Die DDR hat mit diesen Plattenbauten mit ungefähr 40, 50 Jahren gerechnet, Standzeit. Die sind jetzt überschritten. So, also jetzt werden die vielleicht noch einmal saniert, jetzt werden sie noch zweimal saniert. Und dann wird eine Phase eintreten, wo ich denke, da muss man auch mal über einen Rückbau reden. Dass das im Moment von vielen nicht akzeptiert wird, ist sicherlich auch einer gewissen Nostalgie geschuldet, die die DDR im Moment genießt, die ich aber überhaupt, weil ich diesen Staat kenne und viele von den jüngeren Kollegen kennen die nicht, wissen überhaupt nicht, sag mal, was sie da eigentlich verherrlichen. Aber es sei unbenommen, sag mal, auch da hat es sicherlich ähm, Dinge gegeben, die erhaltenswert sind. Ob die Plattenbauten dort am Neustädter Markt dazugehören, das wage ich zu bezweifeln. Time will tell what happens with the DDR buildings at the Neustädter Markt. There's good reason to keep some buildings from all periods, but we have to be intelligent about which ones we keep, especially in case of a key location in the city like this, which could be turned into a warm, inviting and bustling place. Holding onto low quality prefab buildings is a strange choice. Perhaps an information sign to show how it used to be can serve the same purpose. Also, there is an endless quantity of DDR heritage left in the rest of Dresden. Anyway, I'm happy to hear your opinions about this in the comments. Then the third and final point of critique, and that is that the reconstructions would be fake or even a falsification of history. It's true that some of the buildings weren't fully reconstructed internally. This means that some only have a Baroque facade pasted on. This is where some people say, that's fake. But there's a twist. Having a facade stuck on is far more common throughout history than one might think. The Romans, for example, were experts at it, decorating brick walls with a marble veneer. If the Romans could do it and we even see it as authentic, then why is it forbidden for us? Some say we shouldn't rebuild what was bombed as it would be history falsification and we must build things that are of our time. Well, the Neumarkt was built in our time and as a result is by definition modern. It's not exactly like it was before. Maybe that's bad, but maybe it's better. Who knows? And who cares? People love it, so let's enjoy this new Baroque Neumarkt. Before I forget, gentrification, is that simply what happened here? Well, nothing has been torn down for these new buildings, because there was nothing there. In the Neustädter Markt, if it wasn't obvious yet, they can't replace the DDR housing, so they will build there using road space and parts of the large square. So housing will only be added and not converted or taken from anyone, especially not affordable housing. So after all we've seen of the rebuilding of Dresden, what can we learn from this city and the people fighting for it? First of all, if you show that you have the required support of the population, the seemingly impossible suddenly becomes possible. But for that, you'll need to organize petitions, polls and do long-term campaigning. And then you might achieve this too in your town, just like the GHND did in Dresden. Secondly, the cost-benefit ratio of restoring beautiful historical buildings can be very positive. The additional costs of the Baroque facades in Dresden, according to Torsten Kulke, were only 3 to 5%. But the effect was huge. Dresden is now a rapidly growing city and it has attracted many innovative companies. This is not all because of the architecture of course. It's partly done by investing in good education, incentives, etc. But still, if you want to keep talented people in your city, it needs to be attractive. People vote with their feet. So a beautiful city will lead to more visitors, more business and in the end, more livability and happiness as well. Finally, find investors with skin in the game. What do I mean by that? Well, you have anonymous overseas investors without any connection to a place. And as you can probably guess, they don't care about what they built and what it looks like. 
but there are also local developers who live in the same places where they built and who have friends and family there, like Bernd Dietze and Frank Wiesner. They will probably be willing to do much more for that place, as they are part of the community. And they are your allies in the fight for a more beautiful city. All in all, Dresden has turned out very well. And it has inspired other places to rebuild their lost heritage too. Like in Berlin and Potsdam. But the fight isn't over. I'll be following the GHD's progress closely. And if you want, you can donate to them. It is inspiring to see a city regain some of its beauty after so much destruction and death. But more than that, it is magical to see places that were dead and empty to come to life again. And I believe that Dresden offers many lessons on how other cities could achieve the same thing. Thank you for watching. If you liked this, you'll love the next video about why architecture became so weird over time. First of all, a big thank you to our patrons. Don't forget to check out the incognito deal in the description. And I hope to see you in the next video.